you're holding to the faithfulness of God. We just give him praise today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you will not fail. We thank you that you are stronger and more powerful than anything that comes against us. Father, I pray that we would hold closely the words of Jesus, that Father, you have not been overcome, but you have overcome the world. And there are times, Father, where we feel overcome. But Lord God, you are faithful. You are faithful. And I pray today, Lord God, that your word, and your presence, and our praise comes as encouragement and that our eyes would be firmly fixed on you that our faith would rest on you Jesus for what I am incapable of nothing is impossible for you so move in a powerful and a mighty way so that one day we will declare the testimony of this season and say, Christ was my firm foundation and he did not fail. Father, we love you and we praise you and we pray that you would open our hearts to your word and that in obedience we would follow where you lead. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm Pastor Paul, and I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. And as I reflected over last week's sermon, I felt like the Lord was impressing on me that there was a little bit more for us to lean into when it comes to our understanding of what it means to be the church. So as we dig deeper, let's start with a question today. And the question is this, what do you think about the church? Do you think that the church is an accurate model of what God intended it to be? Do you think the church is an accurate model of what God intended it to be? And if your answer is no, then what's keeping it from being all that God intended the church to be? You see, God's plan for his church, or the, the term that we looked at last week, his ecclesia, that's the word used in Scripture, was to be a gathering of his people, empowered and indwelled by the Holy Spirit to spread the good news of Jesus. That's what the church was. It was to be a gathering of his people, empowered and indwelled by the Holy Spirit to spread the good news of Jesus. So what hinders that from being reality? What keeps the church from being that place where it is a gathering of people empowered and indwelled by the Holy Spirit spreading the good news of Jesus. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to John chapter 9, and I think we're going to find some wisdom and truth today in this passage of Scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, feel free, turn to John chapter 9. If not, the words are going to be on the screen behind me. You can follow along on our app, and there's a stack of free Bibles in the back of the room. That's our gift to you today. But in John chapter 9, that's in the New Testament, the Bible's broken up into two parts, Old Testament, which was before Jesus was on the scene. It was from creation all the way through the prophets and the preparation for the Messiah. And then we have the New Testament. And the New Testament is the story of Jesus come incarnate, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the birth of the early church. So we're going to be in the Gospel of John. That's the fourth book of the New Testament. Chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says this, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And so here in the context of this scripture passage, we have this encounter, and Jesus is going, the disciples are walking along, and they see this blind man begging. And like young people often do, they asked an ignorant question. Maybe it was one that they were debating with one another, Right, they're probably like, hey, Peter, who do you think sinned, this guy or his parents? And John's like, I don't know, let's ask Andrew, right? And they ask, they say, this guy is blind. Is his parents sin 
that caused it? Or was it his sin that caused God's punishment? And I was starting to think about this, and I'm like, well, I don't know. How much sin could he have done in the womb, right? I mean, was he a bad fetus or something, like just really kicking bombs bladder all the time? And so here they are, and they're debating because, see, this was the theological belief that they had, that if you were born with an affliction, if there was an illness, that there was sin in your life or in your family's life that you were punished by God. And, you know, as I'm reading this, I started thinking, and I'm like, man, you know, that sounds a lot like the church sometimes. See, I think the thing that hinders the church from being all that God wants it to be is this. It's the ignorant judgment of other people. It's the ignorant judgment of other people. Because here's this moment, here's this blind guy. The Bible tells us blind since birth, and he's sitting there and he's begging. And the Christ followers, literally the first Christ followers, the disciples, as they're walking by, they don't have one ounce of compassion. They didn't say, how can we help this guy? They didn't turn and say, hey, Jesus, you're pretty powerful in heal, folks. You want to hook this guy up with some healing today? No, their first thing is they just want to start a debate. Like, so who do you think's the sinner here, him or his parents? And there's this ignorant judgment And so often I feel like churches and people, because that's what we are, we're people, right? We often let the stupid thoughts of our mind come out our mouth upon one another. And for some of you, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here today, even though at some point you were the recipient of ignorant judgment of some Christ followers. Thank you for not giving up on church because somebody else passed stupid judgment when they did not know the extent of the situation or the circumstance. And then for the rest of us, maybe there's a challenge for us too, though. There are still empty seats in the room. Could it possibly be because we've passed ignorant judgment upon others and we've turned them off for Jesus? But so we have this moment. The disciples are walking, there's Jesus, there's this blind guy. And they just say, hey, by the way, who sinned? him or his parents, and Jesus decides he's going to answer them. He's going to fill them in. And so in verse 3, we follow along in the story, and it says this, neither. Jesus runs, neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Man, this verse of Scripture will wreck your theology. He says, neither, nobody sinned. This man was born this way, why? Because God's grace is greater than we think. God is bigger than our circumstance. God is bigger than your sense of entitlement. And there are times where we sit there and we cry out to God and we're saying, God, why am I going through this? Why does my child have this? Why do I have to struggle with this? Why, why, why? I don't deserve it. It's not fair. It's somebody else's fault. It's not my fault. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Either way, God is still sovereign. And God, Jesus, right there says, nobody sinned. I just wanted him to be born blind. Am I not still God? Do you feel so entitled to sight that you overlook the gift of life? See, we always look at what other people have. And then we judge ourselves according to them instead of judging ourselves according to what God gave us. This is powerful. And this is this powerful understanding that is God not sovereign? And if we will allow God to be a part of our story, if we will allow God to be a part of our life, can he not do the miraculous if he so chooses and wills it. And so right here you have this moment. This is profound. And then Jesus goes on and he drops some serious knowledge in the next few verses. In verse 4, Jesus says this. He says, as long as it is a day, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
And he's using this and he's speaking in language that was metaphorical for the time. They understood life and they reference it by daylight and nighttime, right? He's saying as long as you have life, as long as there is life in us, we must do the work of him who sent me. Because night is coming when no one can work. Our time will be fleeting. And he goes on to verse 5 and he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so Jesus says, listen, we must be intentional and focused with our time here on earth. And so in the midst of this moment where there's this interaction with the disciples being ignorant, there's still the blind guy there begging, Jesus decides he wants to teach us some very important principles on what does it mean to be the church. And the first thing he says is, I think this, that we need to be mindful of our time. Be mindful of your time. Because here you have the disciples talking and arguing over the stupidity of why someone might be born blind instead of doing anything in their power to help him and have compassion on him. Do you not know that our days are finite? It's limited. It's set. It's fleeting. It's short. We always think that there is tomorrow and that whatever is important, it can wait. But there will be a sunset on my life, and I cannot waste or squander one moment of it. Some years ago, I remember going to see a movie. And I went to see this movie, and it was a terrible movie. And I don't mean bad content. I mean, it just was a dumb movie. It was so stupid. It was one of those movies that I know my IQ dropped 50 points (laughs) by having watched the stupidity of this movie. And as I left the movie theater, I had this thought, that I will stand before God one day, and I will give an account of how I just wasted Two hours of my life. Now you say, well, Pastor Paul, that's a little drastic. Is it though? My life is a gift from God. And that's just a small snapshot that, man, if I just wasted two hours, time is ticking. There is more life behind me than ahead of me. And in fact, I believe that's probably true for a lot of you in this room. From a numeric standpoint, if God graces us with the average lifespan of an American, there is more time behind us than ahead of us. And I am accountable to be mindful of what I spend my time doing. And here's the disciples with this guy who's obviously got a crisis. And their brilliant idea is to ask stupid, judgy questions instead of roll up their sleeves and get involved with the time they have here on earth and with the time they have with Jesus. And the second thing that I think is so important for us as we understand what does it mean to be the church is to do this. Be intentional to do God's work. Be intentional to do God's work. So what will you do with your life that will matter for all eternity? Really, I mean it, of all the things we can do, what will we do, what will we invest in that will outlive us? What will people say at our funeral? What memories will they share? What investments did we pour out in our time and our treasure and our talents that will last for all eternity? Am I gonna spend my time, what fleeting time there is before the sunset of my life, building Paul's kingdom? We're building God's kingdom. What really matters here? Passing ignorant judgment on one another or becoming the hands and feet of Jesus in a lost and broken world? Being intentional with each and every day, with each and every encounter, with each and every moment. I mean, let's be honest. How many times... Have you and I just wasted time? And that time could have probably maybe had an impact on somebody's life. Well, let's pick up the story of Jesus and the disciples and the blind man and see what happens. In verse 6, it says this, that after saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. We'll come back to that, because that's weird. (laughs) 
Go, he told him, and wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means sent. So the man went and he washed and he came home seeing. All right. Happy ending. Yay, Jesus. But I want you to just envision this. Remember, Jesus is walking along. It just says, I'm, he was walking along, and there's the disciples, and they ask him this question. And then the very next thing it says is that Jesus bent down, and he made a mud pie, and he smears it all over the dude's face. It means the blind guy's there for the whole conversation. Like the disciples are like, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus is like, neither of them. I did this to him. And the blind guy's like, I'm right here. I can hear you. And Jesus is like, no, I got you, bro. I'm going to make mud with my spit. And I'm going to rub it all over your face. And you're all laughing, but some of you pay money to get that done on a regular basis. But I'm telling you, this is, this, so he makes mud, and then he smears it on the blind guy's face. Are you ready? And then he sends him on a scavenger hunt. He says to the blind guy, as if you couldn't see already, I put a mud mask on you. Now go to the pool of Siloam and wash in it. Man, that almost sounds cruel. Like, and you're sitting there and you're saying, I, oh, this is what I think about. I don't know what you all think. I mean, you, know, you guys are like, well, you only work one day a week, Pastor Paul. No wonder you can think of things like this. <laughs> I mean, Jesus literally, he could have just said, I mean, if I was, this is how you know the Bible is real and legit. Because if I was writing the story, I'd be the editor to be like, yo, dude, that makes Jesus sound weird, bro. Can't we just have him look at the blind guy and say, I give you sight. That sounds, why do all of this? Like why wipe mud and and why tell the dude to go fetch healing? Like what is going on? And so as I, since I only work one day out of the week, I have plenty of time to think about things like this. And I came up with why I think that happened. I came up with two reasons, and here's the first one. You ready? I think the first reason why Jesus did it this way is because first, healing requires on our part to believe that God can heal what we're broken by and then to take action to walk into that healing. Let me say that again. That faith requires that on our part, we believe that God can heal what we're broken by, but then we have to take action to walk into that healing. Because the blind guy did have a choice. When some strange dude that he doesn't know is wiping mud all over his face, the blind guy could have just stayed blind, covered in mud. And I think a lot of times, God wants to heal us, but we don't actually want to put faith and walk into that healing and go to the pool and wash. We want to just stay blind, covered in our mud, and in our victimhood. See, because the guy's identity at that moment was he was a blind guy. He was always blind. He was born blind. He was comfortable being blind. It's just easier to stay the victim instead of to put faith in God and then walk out of that into my healing. And sometimes I feel like as followers of Christ... God's over here putting mud on our face and saying, now I want you to step out of that for your healing. And the rest of us are saying, no, no, I'm cool. I mean, if I actually have to put forth effort, God, I'm not going to do it. And the second reason that I think he did this was so that this blind man, when he went and got his healing, would be a message of hope to the other broken, afflicted, lost hurting, and searching people that would be around the pool of Siloam. You see, the pool of Siloam, it was a freshwater spring there, and it was at the entrance to the Temple Mount. 
And so where Jesus and the blind guy and the disciples are is 397 feet above the Temple Mount. Yet yeah, Jesus smeared mud on the blind guy and told him to go walk down 397 flights of stairs, right? Like, I mean, yeah, like there's 397 feet of elevation from where they were to the Pool of Siloam. But did you know that the Pool of Siloam, that was the place where when travelers were on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to go to the temple to worship God, that they would all stop first. They would stop at that pool and they would wash themselves, and cleanse themselves from the dirt of the journey. At that pool, there would be other cripples and other people of infirmity that were begging because they knew that people were coming who might have a conscience for God and take pity on them. And so Jesus, he wipes mud on this guy's face and he tells him to go down there and to wash in that water and get healed so that this would be a demonstration of what God could do for people who find Jesus. And so I believe that one of the reasons why God sent this guy on the scavenger hunt to go down there and wash when he could have just spoke it right there is because he wanted his healing to be a demonstration to others of what he could do. And so today as we're talking about what does it mean to be the church, and we talked about being mindful of our time, being intentional to do God's work, the third and last statement that I want to talk about is be contagious. Be contagious. You see, the passage goes on. We're not going to have time to go into it. But the passage goes on that that man went and he got healed. He washed the mud off of his face and he was healed, and he began to share with everyone. It says that he then went home too, and he shared with his neighbors. He displayed the power of what one encounter with Jesus could do. And I think that that's how you and I, as people who've had an encounter with Jesus, are supposed to live. We are supposed to live in such a way that our life literally would be the equivalence of being blind and then now seeing. That when we encounter Jesus, we are supposed to live such a radically transformed life that it would appear so different, that it would be no different than a blind man who got sight. And I want you to understand this. The scripture already told us this guy was blind from birth. He never saw a day in his life. And Jesus passes by, and the disciples say something stupid, as disciples of Jesus often do. And then Jesus says, no, it's okay, I, I planned it this way. You did what? Yeah, no, I, I'm okay with you being blind or crippled or having a diagnosis or having an issue because I'm still bigger than that. And then Jesus puts mud on his face and says, now go down and wash. And at some point that guy probably has heard other people and so many things, but he just said, you know what, I believe this guy. What else do I have to lose? Stay blind? At least I got to go wash the mud off my face anyway. And he goes down there, and as he's washing, as he's trying to get to the water, and as he's washing, and he opens his eyes, and all of a sudden, he has healed perfect, pure eyes to see a world that he has never seen before. I mean, can you imagine? Put yourself in his shoes that literally on that day, he has sight. He's like, oh my gosh, Bob, that's what you look like. I thought you'd be taller. Mary, you have beautiful hair. Oh my goodness, this is where I live? What, what is that? A sunset? It's magnificent. How would he walk around the rest of his life? Do you think he would keep his mouth shut? Do you think he would be intimidated, ashamed, or embarrassed of Jesus? In fact, the story even goes on that the temple leaders and the high priests, they gathered him. They went and they found him and they said, hey man, you tell us what happened to you. And he goes, all I know is this, Jesus. I was blind, now I can see. How'd that happen? Jesus. I don't know the science. I don't know what happened. All I know is this, what? Jesus changed my life. And I can see, I was blind. And I think one of the reasons why the church is so ineffective and not all that it could be is because we got a lot of people who were walking around and just got the gift of spiritual sight 
And they're not telling anybody. And they're not living like they've been radically transformed. They're walking around like they still are blind. They're laying on the mat with the mud still on them. And God is saying, I delivered you. I healed you. I set you free. I redeemed your soul. Live like it. So many of us in our lives, listen, we're going to be more excited for something that happens on Sunday afternoon than we are for what God is doing right here on Sunday morning. You're going to spend more of your time and your talents and your treasures cheering on millionaires. When the King of kings and the Lord of lords died for your soul. And he offers life, transformation. And we wonder how we got here. And then we wonder why people don't want what we have. Because it doesn't even look like we want what we have. And we're not living that life. Like we're being mindful of our time because it's short. Being intentional in God's work and being contagious with what we have experienced and seen firsthand in our lives. And for some of you here this morning, and this is a radically new message for you, and that as I've been teaching, the Holy Spirit has been impressing upon your life right now that you are the blind guy. And right now you have a decision to make to continue to live in that blindness or to surrender and accept the healing that Jesus brings. And if that's you, I want to give you that opportunity to put your faith and your trust for the healing of your soul. Just as that guy put his faith and his trust for the healing of his sight. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. It is a non-negotiable promise from God that confession of Christ as Savior and submission to Him as the Lord and the leader of my life guarantees me not only the salvation for my eternal soul, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God who will radically transform me from the inside out, who will not only make a better life for me, but make me better at life, who will bring hope and life and victory to every aspect of my life as I surrender it to Him. Maybe that's you today. And so here's what I'm going to ask. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around, just in the sincerity of this moment. If you have an assured faith in Christ, then I'm going to ask you to pray for those around you. Pray for those watching online. Pray that there is a response to the gospel of Jesus today. And if you are longing for the assurance of faith and salvation through Christ alone, then pray with me and invite him and surrender your life now. Pray with me as I pray out loud. Dear Jesus, here I am. I surrender my life to you. All that I was, all that I am, all that I will ever be, God. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus, you are Lord. You died on the cross and you rose again in victory. You paid for my sins and my mistakes and my shortcomings. And through your sacrifice, you have set me free. And upon this confession of faith and the surrender of my life, fill me now with the fullness of your Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me, to transform me, and to radically change my life forever. And I pray all of this in the name above all names and the only name by which mankind must be saved. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you pull out that Connect card that my friend Sky talked about earlier in the service? It's in the seat back in front of you. And on the back side there, there's that next step. And the first one says that I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Would you fill out that card, check it off, and drop it in the offering boxes on your way out today? We want to come alongside you as your church and as your family to help you on your faith journey. 
Because one of the other things that when Christ died and set us free, when we have a new life in Christ, is that we also get adopted into his family. We are no longer spiritual orphans, but we got spiritual brothers and sisters to help us, to walk with us, to encourage and support us, to hold us accountable when we stray, to breathe life and encouragement into us when we're defeated. That's what the church does. Second next step says, I will be. Will you be more mindful of your time here on earth? Will you be more intentional to do God's kingdom work? Will you be more contagious with the transformation that you've experienced through Christ? What is the area today that maybe God's spirit is just leaning in and saying, hey, here's, here's where there's some space for improvement. Here's some things that we want to do. Because the daylight is only shining for so long on our lives before the sun set. What we do here matters. And I want to make the most of it. Because every person, every encounter matters to God. And I don't want to miss one kingdom moment of life change by being so preoccupied with the things that don't matter that I miss out on a significant life that impacts for eternity. Third next step is to sign up for one of our growth groups. Our growth groups kick off this week and growth groups are where we make a large church feel small and intimate, where we take these big rows and we turn them into small circles in people's homes, where we gather together for the next 10 weeks, dive into God's word, laugh, have fun, make some friends, and grow closer and more connected with one another. And I wanna encourage you to sign up. They'll probably be filled up by tomorrow. And so if you're interested, jump on there. They meet all different times during the week, all different studies, different opportunities. We just wanna encourage you to take advantage of that. Our fourth next step is to, if you're a guy, a senior in high school through a senior citizen, sign up for Fight Night. And we got a trailer video here to show you what's coming on September 29th and who our guest speaker is. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna tell you three things that I think you have to master if you're gonna be a great leader. You gotta master yourself, master your subordinates, and then the last thing you need to be able to master is sacrifice. I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up in the U.S. Army and how I ended up in Mogadishu, Somalia, getting shot at and taking part in the events of Black Hawk Down. I think many people think, oh, Jeff got shot at and he got scared and, and he's different because of it. And really that wasn't it. Been in firefights and previous combat um, tours before this. You be honest with yourself for just a second. Are you the kind of guy who's going through life just simply looking for comfort and looking for convenience? Every time it gets hard, you're running for the escape. Because if that's the way you're living your life, you will never become the warrior that God has created you to be. And every fiber of my being was saying, no, Jeff, don't do this. This is crazy. It's suicide. You're going to get yourself killed if you go back out there. I mean, God is sending us to go out and to impact the world for King Jesus. In fact, the Holy Spirit punched me in the face at this instant and helped me realize, Jeff, your job as a Christian soldier is not just to prepare warriors to meet the enemy. It's to prepare them for eternity. Some of you may be familiar with the motion picture Black Hawk Down. Jeff was portrayed in that movie and his actions. And just a serious encounter that even there in the midst of that battle, the Holy Spirit talked to him encouraged him, you can't leave your brothers behind. You got to go back out. That's what we're talking about spiritually, guys, at fight night. As we fight for our brothers. So if you got a friend or a neighbor, co-worker, or classmate, senior through high school, through senior citizen, maybe they wouldn't normally come to church, but they want to come hear his story. They'll come to something cool like that. And man, we want to invite you because our goal is that by whatever means necessary, we want to share the good news of Jesus. We want to see men worshiping Jesus. 
leading their families and starting a revolution of love and life change here in Hernando County. So that's why we do fight night. And so ladies, go ahead, sign them up, all right? Because we know he don't know how to work that computer technology thing. You scan that QR code, you sign them up. Guys, invite your friends, your buddies, and your coworkers. Let's pack the house on Friday, September 29th, and let's see what Jesus does in the lives of our men and in the lives of our families and our community here in Hernando County. And our last next step is to memorize John chapter 9, verse 4. It's one of our key scriptures today. And Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Our time is fleeting. What will we do with our time, our talents, and our treasure that will last for eternity? It's been an honor and a privilege to share this word with you. And if you're new here, I would love to meet you in our first time guest lounge after the service. The band's going to come up. They're going to lead us in a closing song of worship as we dismiss. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for this time. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be faithful to hear your word and to do what it says. Father, as you have spoken truth, may we embody it. We were once lost, but now found. Once blind, but now we see because of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.